to Marita Sister Corner's 11th video. Today we will talk about the four Marys. Mary Stuart became Queen of Scots in her cradle. Her early years were spent in an atmosphere of an ease as her mother, Marie de Guise, sought to protect her from the predatory Scottish nobles, who fought for the regency and for control of the little queen. The nobility was divided between those who supported the French and Catholic alliance that Marie represented and those who looked to a newly Protestant England to support the Burgonian Scottish Reformation and appointed four girls to be her companions and later ladies in waiting. What all the girls had in common as well as their Christian name was noble birth and similarity in age to the Queen. There was also, whether deliberate or not, a pun in the choice of girls called Mary, as Marie was a Scottish word for maid, derived from the Icelandic Mare. Their name was Mary Beaton, Mary Seaton, Mary Fleming and Mary Livingston. Fleming's mother, Janet, Lady Fleming, was the illegitimate half-sister of Mary's father, James V of Scotland. Livingston was the daughter of the Queen's guardian, Alexander V, Lord Livingston of Callender. Beaton's grandfather was the first cousin of Cardinal David Beaton, one of the men vying for the role of regent. Seaton was the daughter of George IV, Lord Seaton. And she and Beaton was also the daughters of two of Marie de Guise's ladies in waiting. And the location that Marie de Guise chose to most likely keep the Queen safe during these troubled times was the fortress of Stirling Castle. However, soon it became apparent that this was not a long term solution. The English government, first under Henry VIII, Mary's great uncle, and then the Lord Protector and Council of Edward VI, were determined that she would marry Edward VI, a view supported by some of the Scottish nobles. Marie de Guise and the pro French faction among the nobles were determined to prevent this, favoring the old alliance with France, especially when it came well lubricated. With French pensions and intended to marry the French heir, the Dauphin Francois. In preparation for an escape to France, the Queen was sent first to Inchmahon Priory and then to Dumbarton at the coast. It was at Inchmahon that the four Marys joined her household. In 1548 they set sail for France. The girls endured a rough crossing. All except the Queen were afflicted with seasickness. Livingston and Fleming at least had the consolation of traveling with their families since Lord Livingston and Lady Fleming, as guardian and governess, accompanied the Queen. On arrival, Mary was immediately taken into the household of King Henry II's children, while her four friends were sent away. Henry's motive for separating Mary from her companions were twofold. First, he wanted her to speak French and not Scottish. And second, he wanted her closest friends to be his daughters, Princess Elizabeth and Princess Claude. Lady Fleming was essentially sent home in disgrace for bearing King Henry a son. The four Mary were dispatched to the Dominican Royal Priory of St. Louis at Posse. Far from being a backwater, Poesy was at the forefront for Renaissance learning, with close ties to the court. There, the Marys would have received a thorough humanist education, as well as learning the skills necessary to be wives of noblemen, and attendance on a queen. Seaton seemed to have been trained in hairdressing too. Her skill in dressing her mistress's head, first when Mary's lustrous auburn hair was the toast of European courts, 
and afterwards when it thinned and grayed and was augmented by wigs was remarked in. Later the Marys returned to the Queen's household where they enjoyed such domestic pleasures as making marmalade and crystallized fruit. Following her brief period as Queen of France, the widow of Mary returned to Scotland in 1561. Aged 18 and ready to take up the burden of personal sovereignty. Her Marys returned with her as ladies in waiting. The first years in Scotland was taken up by Mary's determination to control the complex political situation she was faced with. A group of nobles led by James Stuart, first Earl of Moray, Mary's half-brother, and calling themselves the Lords of the Congregation, had converted some with more sincerity than others to Protestantism and changed the official religion in Scotland leading them to look for support from Protestant England rather than Catholic France. Mary, no religious fanatic, tried to steer a course between the different factions, which sought to dominate her. When not engaged in state business, the Queen recreated some of the splendor from the court in France. And in this, she was ably assisted by the Marys. The Marys went everywhere with the Queen, even accompanied her to Parliament in 1563. They had stools in her chamber, and to sit in the presence of a monarch was an extraordinary honor. And they took leading roles in the lavish court entertainments so important to 16th century monarchy. They danced at masked, played music for visiting ambassadors, rode, hunted and hawked with the queen and her nobles. More informally, they joined Mary dressing up the Burgess's wives to walk around in Edinburgh and St. Andrews, shopping in the market and cooking. In a faint foreshadowing of another doomed queen, Marie Antoinette. They even put on male costume on one occasion at the banquet for the French ambassador, as well as for practical reasons for hunting. Outraging the sensibility of the increasingly dominant religious radicals. Mary was unfortunate in that her greatest enemy at home was John Knox. Knox, a militant Calvinist, was even more misogynistic than most men at the age were, and spent a good deal of time in weighing against the rule in such delightful times as the first blast of trumpets against the regiment of women, and aggressively lecturing Mary in both public and private. Knox made the most of every innocent pastime derived from youth and high spirits at the Queen's court to insinuate that the Queen and her entourage, including the Marys, lived immoral lives. The pressure mounted for the Queen to remarry. There were many, both home and abroad, that had their eye on the crown and on Mary's person. In a frightening incident, a foolish young poet was found hiding under the royal bed. Mary, too frightened to sleep alone thereafter, took Fleming as her bedfellow. The Queen's affection for the Marys was one argument that was used to persuade her to take a husband, as they had all vowed to stay single whilst she did. Mary did remarry in July 1565, but life for all the Marys would probably have been better if she had stayed a widow. The marriage to Lord Donnelly proved disastrous. Whatever the Marys' earlier matrimonial intention, 
The first of them, Livingston, was married in March 1565 to John Semple, son of Robert, Lord Semple. Knox, who referred to Livingston as Lusty, suggested the match was rushed. Livingston and Semple, who was noted dancers, had been tripping the light fantastic with gusto. The Queen attended the elaborate wedding and gave them a gift of a bed hung with scarlet and black velvet, with embroidered taffeta curtains and silk fringes, as well as land. Drawing Knox's fire again for granting lands to courtiers. Livingston remained at court as keeper of the Queen's jewels. When Mary made her will in 1566, Livingston made up an inventory of her jewels, specimens of which was bequested to the Marys should the Queen die in childbed. Beaton, the best looking out of the four, caught the eye of Thomas Randolph, the English ambassador. Around twice her age, Perhaps he thought his position would attract her. The Queen's biographer, John Guy, referred to them as lovers. But it seems unlikely that one of the Queen's closest friends would expose Mary to the risk of confidential information leaking out. Unless Beaton was acting in consent with Mary, extracting information from Randolph. Beaton must have had the reputation of being political influential with the Queen, since she received letters and gifts from the wife of Sir Nicholas Throckmorton, one of the other English ambassadors. Beaton was courted by Randolph for some time, but in 1566 she married Alexander Ogilvy, by whom she had at least one son. Beaton died around 1598 and her widower promptly married Lady Jane Gordon, the wife whom James Hepburn, Earl of Bothwell, had thrown away to marry Queen Mary. Livingston was full of spirits and Beaton was the prettiest, but Fleming apparently carried the palm of overall attractiveness. As Queen of the Bean at the Twelfth Night Ceremonies in 1564, she was dressed in cloth of silver and jewels, and this flower of the flock's dazzling looks attracted poetry and prose panegyrics. William Maitland of Leighton courted Fleming in 1564. Maitland had a checkered history in Mary's service, one of the few nobles who was Protestant by conviction. He had joined the Lords of the Congregation and was friend with Sir William Cecil, the English State Secretary, whose whole life was dedicated to eliminating Mary. Maitland failed to warn Mary about a plot to kill her secretary, David Rizzio. Anne is likely, too, that he knew about the plot against Donnelly. Fleming, of course, probably had no idea of the extent of Maitland's duplicity. Maitland seemed to have fallen headlong in love with her, and his passion was the subject of some mockery at court. Nearly 20 years older than she was, he was described by one courtier as being as suitable for her as I am to be Pope. Maitland has been identified as the prime suspect for the forging of the casket letters, whatever his machinations. He later became an adherent to what was known as the Queen's Party, that wished to restore her, if not to fully monarchy, then at least to regency her son James. The Queen's Party, including Maitland and Fleming, held Edinburgh Castle in 1573, but when it was captured by the English, they were handed off to the regent, Morton. Fleming was freed, struggling to retain her diamond and ruby chain that had been Queen Mary's, whilst Maitland carried out of the castle in a litter 
died before he could be brought to trial. Suicide was rumored. The king's party planned to hang, draw and quarter his dead body, but Fleming wrote to Cecil asking him to intervene. He passed a plea to Elizabeth, who requested the Scottish lords spare his body. Fleming waited until 1583 for Maitland's lands to be restored. She and Maitland had two children, a son, James, converted to the old-fashioned faith and fled to France, while their daughter, Margaret, became Countess of Roxburgh. Seton never married, but stayed with her mistress for many years. After the surrender at Carberry Hill, she joined Mary in captivity at Lochleven Castle. By standing at the window in the Queen's clothes, she gave Mary time to slip out of the castle and escape across the lock in a rowing boat. Later, when Mary fled to even more onerous imprisonment in England, Seton was permitted to join her and spent 15 years incarcerated in a gloomy series of castles where Mary wore her life out. In 1570, Seton's mother wrote to her, and she was apprehended by the king's party who sought to banish her from Scotland for communication with Mary's household. Elizabeth intervened, requesting forbearance of the cause be no greater than writing to her daughter. By 1583, even Seton's devotion and health were tried by the long imprisonment and she was given leave to retire to the French convent in Reims. Seton lived long enough to see her mistress's son James inherit the crown of England. Dying in 1615 and being buried in the convent she had dwelt in for over 30 years. Well, that was all for this time. Next video will be out May 11th and it will be about Catherine de Medici.